two claps. Thank you. <laughs> two claps and one shout. There we go. All right, let's stand and worship the Lord. Feel free to give him uh, everything this morning. Feel free and comfortable in worship this morning as we lift up his name. Amen. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my turn till I met you. I was breathing, but not alive. My failures I tried to hide It was my turn Till I met you You called my name Sin was heavy, but chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan. Now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing. Now your love is the air that I'm breathing. I have a future, my eyes are open. Cause when you call my name, I need 
needed a rescue. My sin was heavy, but chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter. I was an orphan. Now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing. Now your love is the air that I'm breathing. I have a future. My eyes are open. Cause when you call my name, shut it. I ran out of that crate. Out of all the talk.
Let's sing this out. How can I begin to thank you for all that you've done for me? Jesus, to fully praise you, it will take all eternity. And just like Lazarus, oh, you brought me back to life. How can I begin to thank you for all that you've done for me? Just to fully praise you, it will take all eternity. And just like Lazarus, oh, you brought me back to life. Mm -hmm. How can I begin to thank you for all that you've done for me? Just to fully praise you, it will take all eternity. Just like Lazarus, oh, you brought me back to life. You brought me back to life. You brought.
Let's take a couple seconds to just praise him and thank him.
Amen. He is good. He changes lives. That's what he does. And he's still working on me, and I'm so thankful. I am so thankful that he is still working on me. Doug needs a lot of work. We're going to worship the Lord in our giving this morning. That is part of our worship here. And so uh, the Bible says that God loves a cheerful giver. Now, it would probably do us good to study that word cheerful and find the meanings of that. It can mean generous, it can mean happy, a lot of different meanings. But for you, figure out what that word is. What does that word mean to you when he says he loves a generous giver? And we want to please God, amen? We want to do what he asks us to do, we want to please him. So to be generous in your giving, have you ever, and, and I'll say you probably have, I've done this a lot, and I, I try to get better at this with the Lord's help, but on my own, I'm a disaster. <laughs> uh, wrestle with what the Lord would have you to give. Have you, have you done that, sat and wrestled, and you feel like you had an amount, and, and the Lord would say, no, that's not quite enough, or, you know, you can do better than that. And it's not about the amount, we know that, but it's about the obedience, it's about the walk that you have with Him the relationship in Christ that we have. And so many times that Doug wants to, well, maybe I maybe I might need this or maybe I might should save this, but that's that's the wrong answer. He supplies all that I need. And even more so, the right answer is to obey. So when you wrestle with that, it feels so good to give it to the Lord. It feels good to obey. And you can walk away with knowing that you pleased him. So think about that today. Father, we thank you this morning. We are so glad to gather this morning. Looking forward to that, to gathering with each one here at Bethesda. Worshiping you, God. Starting a great day together. For we've been on many walks this week, many different directions, God. And we come together as one body, serving and worshiping you, hearing from you today, God. We just thank you for the coverage that you cover us with, the protection that you've, you've protected us this week, God. We thank you for being able to be here this morning in your presence together. Father, we, we give, we bring the tithe out of obedience. We, we give offerings and alms, God, because your word uh, encourages us and tells us to do that. And we want to please you. We give you thanks and praise and ask your blessings upon the, the giver and the gift this morning. In Jesus' name. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all. Try it again. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless. He is worthy, is he not? He is worthy to be praised, to be glorified, to be magnified. He is worthy of all of our praise. Amen. Just a few announcements. Um, we want you to know that we want to encourage you to be inviting people, encouraging people, uh, going into your neighborhood, talking to your friends and family members, Vacation Bible School is coming up. Yeah. Nothing works better than word of mouth. 
witnessing. You can pass out tracts all day long. You can meet them in the street with a bottle of water with your church's label on it. But, man, what works the very best is when we personally speak to them about something that's happening or Jesus. Amen? Amen. So we want to encourage you to do that. Also, it's time for registrations to begin um, for the School of Ministry. They have already began. Uh, Impact School of Ministry. We want you to and encourage you to be a part of that. Even if you're not taking it for college credit and you just want to take it for the certificate. Some of you have talked to me and you're scared to death to take it for credit because you don't know if you're able to do the work. How many of you know we ought not think like that? Is that right there, James? We should, we should know, man, greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. And so I'm telling you, how many of you know we need discipleship? We need learning. We need to be educated. We need to know the word of God. And that's what these classes are for. So if you're interested in Every Man a Warrior, book one, you've never taken it. If you're interested in Cultivating Holy Beauties, book one, and you've never taken it. Or you've taken it and you just need a refresher or you didn't complete it, then that will be starting also in August. So please get with Heather, get a packet, get registered so we can know um, how many people we're going to have. We also are in the midst of registrations for Impact Christian Academy, and it looks like we're having quite a few, lots of new students coming along. And so let's continue to promote that, push that, talk to people about that, letting them know what we have to offer here. Amen? Amen. Tonight at 5 o'clock, this is the first of the month. We shouldn't even have to say anything, but we still do. Why? We want everybody to show up. 5 o'clock, prayer. Huh? We got to pray to make it today. You, you, you think you can make it without prayer? You're deceiving yourself. Amen? All right, let's all stand. Let's all go around, high five, and uh, greet somebody and let them know you're glad to see them today.
want you to put the verse back up there that talks about I went into the fire. If you would, please. It says, then I, no, back. I was, I was down to the wire. Anybody in here ever felt like, man, you know what, I, I'm, I'm kind of running out of rope here. Thought maybe you were hanging on to the very end of the rope. I mean, you were hanging on, but, you know, you were, you were starting to feel a little bit of that, what God tells us not to feel. You were starting to feel a little weary. I was down to the wire. And, and listen, hoping you'd come through. When I think about that, that just almost doesn't go along with the rest of the song. Because the song is talking about his faithfulness. His faithfulness. In other words, what I know and what I can expect from God. If I'm hoping for something, I'm not real sure about it. I'm not real confident that it's necessarily going to take place. I'm, I'm in hopes that it does. But how many of you know we should not live our lives by hope? We walk by faith, not by sight. Even when I'm at the end of the rope, my faith is, my God is about to come through. Because the very next thing it says, then you stepped into the fire. And the three Hebrew children understood this principle without spelling it out. They said to the king, king, we're not, we're not slow to answer you. We don't even have to really give it much thought because we know that this day the Lord is going to deliver us out of your hand. This day, this day, God is going to deliver us. You see, that's what's wrong with us. We don't know the scripture for one thing. And the second thing, we're just living in hope. Hope is a part of faith, but it is way away from what we need to be standing on. We stand on faith. We walk by faith, not by sight. We live knowing this, that even when we are found in trials and troubles, in tribulation and in distress, in the difficulties of life, God says this, I have made a way. <laughs> not I will or not hope I do. God says I have made a way of escape for you. Amen? Sometime, sometime. And I want you to know I love this song. But sometimes we sing songs that insert this little pieces of things that really just don't add up about God. And I, want, I don't want us to leave here today saying, you know, I was, I was down to the wire, man. I was almost drawing my last breath. And I'm sitting there wringing my hands. I'm sitting there in anxiety. I'm sitting there anxious, God. I'm sitting there a little nervous. And I'm just hoping, oh God, hoping maybe you will show up. I'm going to tell you something. When the enemy's got you in a corner, I want you to know, man, stiffen up. Get your head on straight and look the devil in the eye because my God is about to come through. Not maybe. He is. He is. Oh, man. Sit down before I get too Pentecostal. Tell you what, this God that we serve is faithful. You know what, if I find myself in a mess, guess what? It's not God's fault. Let me say that again. If I find myself in a mess, it's not God's fault. Somewhere in there, somewhere in there. Now, I'm going to examine. How many of you know the scripture teaches us to examine ourselves? For what reason? To see if we're in the, to see if we're lining up with the book. 
right? You can have all the beliefs you want to have, but none of them matter a whole lot if they don't line up with the book. Amen? I want to be a spirit person. How many of you want to walk in the spirit? How many of you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Do you know that being filled with the Holy Spirit just wasn't a once in a, in a, a, a lifetime experience? Hello? It just wasn't an event. It should be every day, every day, every day, the filling, the filling of the Lord in our lives. The every, every day, the Holy Spirit is taking more and more control because we are giving up it. We are yielding. But we, we need to get back to the place to where what we, what we think and, and what we speak lines up with the Word of God because... I don't believe we know it. We say we do. We say we know it. I, I heard somebody talking back to me. I'm like, who's talking back to me? And it's me. Because I didn't have the speaker all the way down on the line. I would say something, then this guy would say something. And I'm like, what? I, I started to say, Yes, Lord. <laughs> but it wasn't. It was some guy in some kind of shirt, <laughs> gray hair, real gray hair, talking back. I, I want to become a word person. Yes. If you're not a word person, your growth is stunted. True. Hello? If you are not walking this out as a word person, now you can... How many of you know that God fully expects us to study on our own? Yes, he does. I, I'm not taken away from that. But he also tells us to make disciples. And how many of you know we need someone pouring into us what they have already received that we need? And so hence we have classes. We have things that we do to help strengthen us. Now you can go to the classes. You could be in signed up, man. You could be the most faithful signer upper. In Bethesda, you could sign up for everything. You can come to everything. But if all you do is sign up and come to the class, it's going to mean that not going to mean very much to you. Because you can't be just a hearer of the word, you have to be a doer of the word. Isn't that right? Last week, Pastor Sean talked to us about doing the word of the Lord. What thus saith the word of the Lord? What does God tell us to do? We don't need to pray for God's will we have God's will what I pray for is an understanding and revelation of what he is saying because I don't understand it all come on and when I do understand it I speak when I don't understand it I pray but yet God says he has given us everything in this word that we need in order that we can live a life of victory. Christians, church people, people in the kingdom of God should be the most victorious people on the earth. We should walk in power and might. We should live kingdom life on this earth now. He says that he has given to us the keys to the kingdom that you and I are able to walk under his authority did you hear that we are walking under his authority to do what to do all the things that he did on this earth now we've been talking about kingdom of God versus Christianity when we look at the world we know the world is messed up Huh? Anybody's, anybody wondering still if the world's messed up? I mean, the world's messed up. It's messed up. It's messed up. It's worse than messed up. It's the, mor the morality of the world has been decaying uh, since the beginning of time, but yet we can see it even getting worse. Amen? I mean, when you, when you walk around hearing people say, that kids that are, that are young, 5, 6, 7, 10, 12 years old, 
are to be able to have a right to go and have their gender changed without even parents' permission. How many of you know the world is messed up? When people are telling you that you ought to just call it uh, 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 we, us, whatever, that you ought to call it, and then at four years old, then they can determine what the gender is. How many of you know the world's messed up? I mean, it's bad. When you've got men that want to be women and women who want to be men and, and, and people fighting for their rights to do all kinds of things. In the little town that I grew up in, in the little town called Salina, Ohio, uh, that I grew up in, only eight or 9,000, something like that, people in it. Every year now, they have what they call a pride parade. Pride parade. Man, I'll tell you what, I'm proud of God. I'm proud of Jesus Christ. But I, I'm, not, I'm not proud of the fact that uh, I'm this or that. Pride parade. They have a pride parade. In this little small town, I would have never imagined in this little small town like this. We, we think sometimes when we're small, a little bit out of the thing, we're not in Louisville, we're not in Cincinnati, we're not in the bigger cities. Man, we're exempt from all this kind of stuff. Our school systems are exempt from all this kind of stuff. We don't have to worry about it. I want you to know the world's gone off its hinges. And what they had there, they had cross-dressers, Dancing in front of the kids. They called it a they called it a family friendly event, and they were selling all kinds of adult toys. One kid, probably fifteen years old, was holding in a picture one of these adult toys. Now I'm only saying this. I'm not saying what the adult, the adult toy was, but I'm just saying this because I want you to know, man, this world's messed up. Yeah. But we also need to realize and confess the church is messed up because we're, we're compensating for these things. We are compromising for some of these things, not all of them. Churches are being pressured to, pr to fly the pride flag. Churches are being pressured to accept and receive people who are of another uh, gender as whatever they say they are. Listen, how many of you know we have preached here for years and we stand on it way before they started hollering about all this stuff? Man, we love you just the way you are. When you come in here, you come in here a man dressed like a woman, guess what? I still love you. But when it comes down to it and talking to you about your situation, I'm going to let you know in love, guess what? You were born a male, you will always be a male. You're not going to be Francis, you're going to be Fran, Sir, Tucker. <laughs> you can't come in here and go to the girls' bathroom. I lost, I, I couldn't think of a good name there for a second. I started to say Fred, but I didn't want to put Fred on the spot. He's in Hawaii joining himself. But we do, we love everybody, don't we? We love the drug addict, we love the alcoholic, we love the person that's struggling and living outside and in the, in the streets, and we love those who have all kinds of things going in their lives. We love them, we hug them, we embrace them, we want them to feel like they're a part of our family. But I want to tell you what we're not going to do. We're not going to compromise the book. We're not going to compromise the book for the world. We're not going to compromise the book for the government. We're not going to compromise the book for the church. We're not compromising the book for you. We love you, but we have to go to the book. Amen? And so we have a church that's gone awry. And so what then is happening then? We live in a society today where people are running around all over the place and we can see them and some of them are just flat out evil. And so what do we try to do? We try to drug them. We try to do all kinds of things to them to get them to straighten out. 
when you know what the church ought to be discerning, the church ought to be recognizing, some of those people are just flat demon possessed. Hello? They're just demon possessed. When somebody walks up and they're looking at their chair that's empty and they're sitting there and they're talking to their chair, I'm going to tell you what, something's messed up. Hello? And then they walk out and they act and they talk in a, in, a, in a wicked, evil way. There's something wrong with them. Some people are just misinformed. They're just deceived. Other people are evil. They are possessed. They are under the influence and power of the enemy. And what the church needs is the church needs to understand we have the keys. We have the keys to deliverance. We have the keys to discernment, to discern what's going on. And instead of saying, man, praise God, maybe you can get a doctor's appointment and they can give you some Prozac to help you with that problem that you have. No, we discern, man. That's a spirit. And we command it and declare freedom in the name of Jesus. But instead, the church coddles it. Cuddles it, pacifies it, tries to make excuses for it. Because of our lack of power. Come on. Then in the church, we, we understand that even Christians can be oppressed. Even Christians can be under the influence of demonic powers. Did you hear me? Have you ever wondered why you just can't get your act together? It's called a spirit. It's a spirit that comes and a spirit that wants to keep you from moving forward, doing the things that God wants you to do. It's deception. And, and have, you ever fig- have you ever wondered why you can be prayed for on Sunday and, woo, feel so good? Huh? That you could actually do what I just did? Woo! Oh, I feel good. Anybody, anybody ever got prayed for and just wanted to do that, but you didn't? But you, well, today maybe you can. <laughs> Woo! I feel good. Get Logan up here in a minute to dance with me. He, he's a that guy can dance, man. Hey. And then on Monday. <sighs> You're right back in the same mode. You're right back in the same path. You're right back in the same pattern. You're going through the same things. And so what are we examining? We're talking about the kingdom of God versus Christianity today because Christianity is messed up. Churches are warped. Churches are trying to coddle people. Churches are trying to satisfy individuals and families and things of that nature. And they're, they're hesitant to speak the truth in love because they don't want to offend anyone. That is not our problem here. But yet, I believe that that is taking place more and more all across the land. Why should we live like that? Why do we not understand that we have the keys for all these things to take place? Sometimes somebody may need to get God a hold of their lives to get them through something or delivered from something or set free from something, but there's a reason why. Luke chapter 10 verse 9 says this, and heal the sick that are therein and say unto them the kingdom of God has come nigh unto you he says say to them the kingdom the finger of God has come nigh unto you the hand of God has come nigh unto you say unto them the kingdom of God has come nigh unto you why because you're doing the work of the kingdom he says in my name they will cast out devils they'll heal the sick they'll raise the dead They'll open blinded eyes. They'll unstop deaf ears. They'll speak with new tongues. All these signs they will do. 
1 Corinthians 4.20 says this, For the kingdom of God consists of and is based on not talk, but power. Amen. Did you hear that? Do you know, you know, in church today, we, we have a lot of talking. If you don't believe that, wait till I'm done preaching this message for the next hour and a half. And then hang around because there'll still be pockets of people in here talking for another 30, 40 minutes. We, we like to talk in the church, don't we? Talk, 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 talk. Even people that you don't think, normally you look at them and you're like, man, they're not very big talkers. They stand around here and yak for an hour after church. I'm thinking to myself, man, I cut that off. I could have went on. I mean, the other week I had to say to some, hey, I'm going to turn out this light. Come this way. There's all kinds of natural light in the foyer. And I'm thinking, man, I, I could have kept on going. They weren't really tired, and they weren't tired of hearing somebody talk because they've been talking. So we could have went on another half hour, 45 minutes longer. And I, I could have got through more because I, I want you to know I never am done. I just stop. <laughs> and the kingdom of God doesn't consist of words, but of power. You can say whatever you want to, but the proof is in the power. And so what are we after? We're after power. But here's what we do. We say, we say, God, deliver. God, deliver. We say, God, set us free. God, set us free. Isn't that what we do? And, and, and we, we don't mind that. We feel okay about that because then we can tell people, I want to be free. I want to be delivered. But, but listen, here's the deal. The deal is this. But God says, I already have. Why are you asking me for something that I've already done? Just walk out the book. That's what God's saying. Walk out the book and understand whom the sun sets free is free indeed. God has set me free. He has given me liberty. 2 Corinthians 3, 17, 18 says, Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the spirit of of the Lord. So if I'm bound, I mean, let's look at that. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty or freedom. So if I'm bound, is the Spirit of the Lord there? If if there's no evidence of power in my life, is the Holy Spirit, has he really taken up residence? We have to begin to ask ourselves some tough questions because of what we have been led to believe does not line up with how we're walking it out. How many of you want to walk this thing out right? How many of you, it doesn't matter what the church has said. It doesn't matter what churches say. It is what God says and what he wants us to do. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty, there's freedom. And so when we look at that, Galatians 5.1 tells us, because we know these things, we know that the Lord, he is merciful. We know the Lord has set us free. He says in Galatians 5.1, he says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again 
with the yoke of bondage. Simple. Do you know the gospel is simple? Do you know the gospel of the kingdom really is not that complicated? Matter of fact, he says the gospel is so simple and broken down in such a way that even a little child can understand it. He says here, he says, he says, don't be entangled again. In other words, the spirit of Christ, Christ has made us free. He said, but listen, don't you go and be entangled again and then get back into bondage. Walk in that freedom. Walk in that liberty wherewith Christ hath made you free. Live a life. How? According to the book. If you live a life according to the book, guess what you won't find? You won't find yourself in bondage. I always thought this was awesome. God tells us in his word another simple thing. Don't be just hearers of the word, but be what? Doers. Doers. Why is that important? Because if you're just hearers only, you're not doing, it's not going to bear any fruit. You're not going to be free. You're not going to have liberty. You're not going to have knowledge. You're not going to do the things. You're going to have embedded theology. You really won't have it in your heart. David said, Lord, your words have I meditated. I, I have meditated them. I've heard them, but I've also hit them in my heart. I walk them out. I live them because I've hit them in my heart so I might not sin against you. But here's the problem. And I believe it does come down to two things. When a person is walking in bondage in the church, it's one of two things. When a person can't seem to have any victory, when a person's life is almost the same every time you see them, that one minute they're up, next minute they're down, they have no consistency, there's no real dedication, there's no knowledge, they're not growing in anything. One of two things is going on there. Either one, they've never been born again. Did you hear me? Either one, they've never been born again, they just had horns sawed off, and they, 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 they outwardly look like a sheep, but they're still inwardly a goat. Or they're a prodigal. There's no middle ground. There's no space in between. It's just that simple. And so what do I have to do first and foremost? I have to then come back to the book and I have to find out then what does a born again person who has entered into the kingdom of God, what does that look like? What does that look like? Well, first of all, it's 1146 already. For you that didn't know, how many of you, probably may not happen to you during the week, but how many of you, your lunch alarm is starting to go off? And you're starting to go, hmm. See, mine goes off at 1130. Even here in church, mine starts going, hmm. Wish I would have had that donut that was offered to me outside there. Alarms start going off. You start thinking about eating, don't you? Why? Because it's a natural thing in us to do what? Eat. Huh? We don't, if, if, if you sit around all day long and for three days, your spouse or your children or somebody was asking you, hey, are you hungry? Oh, you know what? I haven't eaten for three days. I haven't even thought about it. <laughs> How many of you know if you told your doctor, you know what? I'm going three and five, six days. Are you fasting? No. I just, I'm just not hungry. I don't want anything to eat. How many know they'd say to you, something's wrong? <laughs> huh? They'd say, hey, look, dude, something's wrong. You know, you're losing weight. And something's wrong. People are telling me all the time, man, Pastor Jerry, you're losing weight. Somebody hugged me today and said, oh, my goodness, there's not anything to grab a hold of. Just pinch. (laughs) There's still slabs there. Trust me. I see it without this shirt on. And it ain't a pretty sight, let me tell you right now. But I, I, I tell them I wish the pounds would catch up with the inches. Because my poundage isn't going down. But I, I'm going to tell you, if, I, if the doctor looked at me and said, hey, man, last time you were here, you've lost 15 pounds. What are you doing? Well, I just don't eat anymore. I don't, I don't know. I don't like to eat anymore. He wouldn't just say, hey, good job. <laughs> That's awesome, dude. Hey, pretty soon, you know what? You're going to look like the skeleton that I have hanging on the wall. 
Yeah, and you know what? I'll be like that skeleton. I'll be dead. But for some reason in the church, because we don't want to hurt nobody's feelings, we have let people go who know nothing about the word, but yet they say they're born again. We let people go who have no desire or no hunger for the word, and yet they say they're born again. But yet the word of God tells us that somebody that is a newborn babe desires passionately, hungers after the sincere word of the Lord. And so the only time I do without food is if I'm fasting. Well, I want to tell you what, if in your head the devil's telling you it's okay to fast the word of the Lord, he's lying to you. A sign of somebody being born again is that they hunger and thirst after righteousness. They want the word of the Lord. They are trying to learn more and more about Jesus. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. And then because they're faithful to that, what they have learned in the word of God, what do they want to do because they're faithful to Jesus? They want to pass it on, don't they? Things that you have heard of me, that you have learned of me, then give it to faithful men. Pass it on to faithful people. Somebody who is born again wants to disciple somebody. Somebody that's born again wants to pour into somebody. Somebody that's born again wants to encourage somebody. Somebody who's born again doesn't want to isolate themselves and live by themselves and do their own thing. Somebody that's been born again is drawn to and hungers for fellowship. One of the things that we strongly believe in here is fellowship. What are we fellowshipping around? We're fellowshipping around Christ. We're fellowshipping around his word. But yet we have allowed somebody else to semi take up residence in us. The Lord wants us to be filled with the spirit. But he doesn't want us to be moved and directed by our flesh. But we know that that's what's happening today. The church, not all, but for the most part, is governed by fleshly desires and appetites. Things that God tells us not to focus on, we focus on. Things that God tells us not to be anxious over, we get anxious over. Things that God tells us not to allow, we allow. Come on. And we do it all in the name of grace. Grace, grace, grace. It's all about grace. And how many of you know, we believe in grace here. But not grace that excuses what we allow. Come on. When you allow something, confess you allowed it and get rid of it. Come on. In 2 Peter 2, I'd love it. I, I wish that. I, I, I wish that sometimes I'd have a paper over this phone up here so I couldn't see that time. But if you get a chance, read all of it. Second Peter 2, 1 through 22 talks about false prophets among his people and their false teachers. They're trying to teach people damnable heresies. In other words, they're trying to lead people astray. What are they trying to lead them astray in? They're trying to lead them astray in the truth. They're coddling them. They're giving them half-truths. They're they're stating things to them that's not so. And what's happened through and through all that that people are listening to, it, they're finding that what happens is people then are getting trapped and snared in false doctrine. <clears throat> they're finding themselves in turmoil. They're finding themselves like the uh, righteous lot who found himself in Sodom and Gomorrah, and the Bible says that he was vexed. Righteous Lot was vexed by filthy conversation, and the scripture says that it was because of where he dwelt, and it was because of what he was seeing and hearing. Come on. It says it vexed his righteous soul from day to day. You don't think that it's not important about what you see? what you hear, 
and what you dwell in, come on. That's why he said, come out from among them and be ye separate, says the Lord. Because he understands bad company corrupts good morals. Lot's righteous soul was vexed with the filthy conversation and filthy beliefs. But he said, hey, you know what? The Lord knows how, verse 10, or verse 9, the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust under the day of judgment. He said, but they're gone astray. They're a mess. They're spots. They are, they are and, blame, and bl blemishes sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you. They have eyes full of adultery and they cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls. Heart, they have exercised with covets, practices, cursed children, which have, for, listen, which have, now, now, we like to look at that passage right there and we like to say, he's talking about them rotten, stinking, filthy, filthy heathen dogs. He's talking about a wayward church. Hello, he's talking about Christianity gone awry. He says, they have forsaken the right way. Oh my goodness. They have forsaken the right way. And they have gone astray. Other words, man, they don't believe in being sanctified anymore. They don't believe in transformation anymore. They don't believe in commitment and covenant and faithfulness anymore. They don't believe in the indwelling power of the Holy Ghost anymore. They don't believe in the miracles and signs and wonders anymore. They have gone astray. They don't believe in the sanctity of marriage. They have been duped. Following, they're following the way of Balaam, the son of Bosar, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. Listen, for when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lust of the flesh. Do you know why you're in trouble today? Listen, if anybody's in trouble, anybody had trouble this week? Anybody got issues going on? Anybody saying, you know what, gee whiz, I, I need deliverance because it just seems like every time I turn around, I'm doing something wrong. Well, Paul addressed that in Romans 7 and verse 8, did he not? He, he, he didn't say that you had to go get a prophetic word. How many of you know there's nothing wrong with a prophetic word? Don't, don't, don't get your feelings all hurt. That's not what I'm talking about. But here's what he said. He said, you know what? When I go to do good, evil's present. How many of you know evil's in this room? Oh, yeah. Just put your discerner on. The enemy's in this room. He's in this room right now while I'm speaking. He's yakking in some of your ears. You think it might be the Lord, or you think it might be making sense, but he's over here yakking to you. Man, this guy here, man, he's just always in the same place. And in your head, you're going, yeah, I know. I wish he'd change something. Evil is in this room, and we entertain it. We entertain it. We entertain it by being worried about time. We entertain it by how long we're in service. We entertain it by all these things that are going on. Man, we'll sit and watch a movie for three hours. You know, somebody told me yesterday, what, what is that new movie? That, has anybody seen that movie, Avatar? Nobody wants to admit it. I don't blame you. I wouldn't want to sit there and watch somebody run around that's all purple. It does think it's totally unbelievable. It cannot be done. Avatar 2, somebody told me, is if, it's, if you've seen Avatar 2, you should know. I guess somebody told me it's three hours and what? 40 minutes. I, I can't go see that at the theater. Oh, not because I'm saying it's sinful. I can't go that long and not go to the bathroom. <laughs> I mean, I'd be up going, excuse me. Excuse me. And I had to come back. What happened, Sarita? Oh, never mind. Too much to tell. Oh, great. I don't know why they don't have screens all the way down the theater wall and in the bathroom so when you have to go. Three hours and 40 minutes. Did you hear me? Three hours and 40 minutes. But I'm telling you what, countless people sit there and watch the whole movie. And if they like the movie, if they like what it is, they won't complain. They may go see it a second time. Huh? Come on. But you have church for three hours and 40 minutes and they think you've lost your mind. What? 
Where my mom and dad go, they only go 55 minutes. And they're doing okay. Are they? They've gone astray. They promised them liberty, but they themselves are servants of corruption. Listen, for if after they have escaped the pollution of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, they escape the pollution. How'd they do it? How'd they do it? Through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. They are again entangled and overcome, then the latter end of them is worse than the former. Woo! Why is that? Why is the latter worse? Because if you're oppressed in here today, and you come up here this morning, and we pray for you, and you feel, oh man, the Lord has set me free. And then you walk back out of here and go through and do the same behaviors you did when you left here. He says that spirit that was oppressing you, that we took care of, goes and finds seven more worse than himself and comes back and finds your temple in the same condition it was that he got cast out of. And he comes and that person is eight times worse. I hear people all the time, I don't know, it just seems like I'm getting worse and worse. Yeah, because you're not filling this with the scripture and the word and the spirit. You're not walking in what you know. You know what's the truth, but you're not walking in it. You don't live it. You allow the enticing words and the lust of the flesh to control you. Because... We're drawn away by our own lust. So what do I have to do then? I've got to deal with my own lust. Come on, just go ahead and say it. I got to deal with my own lust. Now, you know, lust means a lot of different things. Lust just isn't sexual. You may not have a lustful, sexual bone in your body at all but still be functioning and walking in lust. Come on. You're drawn away by your own lust. Why? Because you're allowing that spirit and those others to take up residence here. That they are causing things to come at you. Because how many of you will confess right now that you're, you're, you're bad at telling the devil all the things he doesn't need to know. Huh? We diagnose ourselves. Oh! Oh, man, am I having a heart attack? We're losing... I'm, I mean, every Sunday I come in here, are you losing weight? And the enemy wants to say, oh, something must be wrong with you. Because last night you ate... Six pieces of pizza and seven <laughs> wings. <laughs> and, and a piece of, oh man, I still have some peanut butter pie in my freezer. <laughs> Two of them, matter of fact, that was brought to me during Christmas. Yeah, he swiped it. Thank God. But I even had a piece of peanut butter pie. But man, look at this. So something's got to be wrong, right? No, maybe my metabolism in my old age is finally caught up. <laughs> but we, we have a problem because of what we are allowing, what we have allowed to stay, what we have allowed to exist, what we have allowed to endure, and we talk to it, and we, we pet it, and we pacify it, because a lot of it we really like. Mm, that's tough, I know. But it's the truth. H here's, here's, here's what he says is happening to them. This is, I always thought this passage of Scripture was gross. But in verse 22, he said, But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb. The dog is turned to his own vomit again. 
and the sow that has been washed to her wallowing in the mire. <laughs> I, got, I got too many residents that I have the authority over. But God tells us, like Pastor Sean said last week, God tells us, get rid of them. Israel's disobedience caused them to remain in bondage. And they didn't, you know what they did? Here's what they did. You know what? I'll tell you what, I know what the elders are telling us and the prophets are speaking, but you know what? That's just not like our God. They're telling us to go into that city and kill everybody. Man, woman, boy, and girl, and all the cattle. They want us to go in there and slay every one of them. That's what they're telling us. That's just not the loving God I serve. I hear that. I hear that a lot. That's just not the loving God. How many of you know this? You don't even know what love really means because God is the only one that knows the true meaning of love. And in his judgment and what he told them to do to those nations was all in God's love because he chooses vessels of honor and vessels of dishonor. Some nations were, had risen up and rejected God and were vessels of dishonor, and God wants them gone. And so he said, get in there, don't spare anything, kill everything. Because he knew what was going to happen. And you see, because Israel didn't like what the prophets were telling them, here's what they said. They said, hey, Samuel, tell God, we want a king. All these nations that are around, they got kings. We want a king. Samuel gets all bummed out. <sighs> What's wrong? They don't want to hear my, the word that I speak. God, it's your word. No, they didn't like it. It didn't make sense to them the way he was telling them. But yet it was still God's word. Because it doesn't have to make sense to you and me. We're just the clay. He's the potter. If he chose this morning to wipe out every single one of us, if every one of us just killed over this morning, he's still justified. God says, Sam, don't worry about it. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. Because they didn't want to hear what thus saith the word of the Lord. And what we do is we don't want to, we, we will say, we'll shake our heads, we'll nod our heads. Yes, I know that this is, this is the book. Every chapter, every verse, every sentence, every dot of the I, cross of the T. Man, this is the infallible word. Come on, raise your hand and wave it. This is the infallible word. It do not make mistakes. Did you hear me? That's why you can't just take a page and tear it out. That's why you can't take fasting out of the Bible. That's why you can't take blood out of the Bible. That's why you can't take the baptism, which is all through the book of Acts, in the Holy Spirit, out of the Bible, no matter what denomination says. This is the book. But they didn't want to hear the book. Give us a king. And he said, okay, I'll tell you what. Tell them this. I'm going to give you a king. But here's what you're going to get when you get a king. They're going to take your wives. They're going to take your children. You're going to be in bondage. And they're going to make you serve. And they're going to make you give to them. They're going to tax you. And then guess what? When they got a king, what they do? They grumble and complain. Man, this is rotten kings. Isn't that how we are? What we do, because we have the book, we have the book. But what do we do? We return to the vomit. We return to old ways, old habits, old desires, old paths, old ways of thinking. We don't allow our minds to be transformed. I'm going to close with this, but this is what's got to happen. This is what has to happen if we are going to be able to get ourselves forward. 
moving. Galatians chapter 4. It's 16 through 31. Read it later, please. But I'm going to start at verse 22. It says, For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. You know why that that happens? Because Sarah didn't believe what the word of the Lord said. She thought her womb was too old to bear Abraham a son. You see, she didn't believe that Abraham was too old, hello, or else she wouldn't have given him her handmaid. But she didn't believe the word of the Lord that said that Sarah's womb was going to have a child. And so what did she do? She dangled a carrot. Let's talk of grapes, some beautiful flowers in front of Abraham. Yoo-hoo. Abraham, I want that son. Here's my handmaid. I'm, a, I'm just going to tell you right now. I guarantee you this handmaid wasn't no dog. I guarantee you she wasn't ugly. And when Sarah said that to Abraham, Abraham probably said, you know, I really don't want to, but if you say, Sarah, I sure want to do whatever you say. I want to please you, honey. Come on, Hagar. What happens, Hagar? They didn't believe God. They didn't trust in God. And so what happens? They have a child. His name's Ishmael. Then a little later on, Sarah conceives, and they have a child, and they name him Isaac. He says, but it's written, Abraham had two sons, one by a handmaid, the other by a free woman. For he was of, of the, for, but he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise. Which things are an allegory, for these are two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which gendered to bondage, which is Agar. And this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answered to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage to, with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free. The kingdom of God is free. One of these days, we're going to see a new Jerusalem coming out of heaven. For it is written, Rejoice, thou barren, and bearest not. Break forth and cry, thou that travailest not. For the desolate hath made, have many more children than she which hath an husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him who was born after the spirit or promise. Even so, it is right now. Listen. Nevertheless, what says the scripture, cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. You want to know why you're not free? Because the bondwoman and her son is still living in your house. And you're not going to be free. Do you know this? Listen. God said to Abraham, you, it's your house, you send Hagar and her son away. Send them out. We, we, we sometimes go along with this, oh, I don't know. I prayed and I prayed, but God just hasn't taken it away from me. I don't know what's going on or what's wrong with God, but he must want this to be my thorn in the flesh because he's not taking it away from me. He, he says that 
Sometimes yes, sometimes yes, sometimes yes, God breaks it off of you. But I'm telling you, the majority of the time, God's not coming there to rip it off of you. God brings it to the surface, and he expects you to cast it off. He expects you to get rid of it. He expects you to expel it from your house. He expects you to put it under your feet. He expects you to take authority as sons and daughters of God over the principalities of the air. He expects you to clean house. He expects you to take off the old garment. Anybody in here since you've been a Christian felt like somehow, some way you slipped on an old garment? Huh? Take off the old garment. Clothe yourself. Clothe yourself in the robes of righteousness. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Cast out the bondwoman and her son. How am I going to do this, Pastor Jerry? How am I going to do this? Do you know that Bethesda has laid out a plan for you that if you would follow, you would find yourself doing what I'm talking about? But do you know the majority of people in here don't do it? Because the way you do it is, I'm sanctified. By the truth. Thy word is truth. I want my mind and my heart to be transformed. I want to be changed. I want to be like Jesus. I want to hang out with people who love Jesus. I want to talk to people who love Jesus. I want to spend time with people who love Jesus. I want to study, 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 study to show myself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. I want to learn. I want to grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to get on the mountaintop. I don't want to stay down the valley. But the enemy doesn't want you there. The enemy doesn't want you there. Many of you have, I think many of you in your heart at the moment, you say, I want that. Because I see your name signed up on class lists. I see your name signed up on seminars. I see your name signed up for, for classes that we have. And then as I look out across there, I see you not there. Because you allowed everything else to get in your way of what's most important. There's nothing more important in your life unless you have to work and you just can't get out of it than groups, first church. We, we should be sitting back trying to figure out how in the world are we going to have enough groups to take care of everybody. Instead of wondering if we're going to have three or four of them full. Because every person in here, there's no exception, needs to be in first church. We understand sometimes you have to miss. We all have had, anybody in here had to miss? I've had to miss. I have to call, but you know what I do? I call up my first church pastor. And I say to my first church pastor, hey, man, sorry, I'm not going to be there tonight. And I just don't say, hey, man, sorry, I'm not going to be there tonight. See you later. I say, hey, man, I'm sorry, I can't be there tonight. And here's why I can't be there. You know why? Because we're accountable. It's another thing in the book people don't like no more. But everybody in here needs to be in first church. Why? Because we break bread. We fellowship. We talk about the things of God. And then we take it out into the streets. <laughs> everybody in here needs to be through. If you're a man in this house and you haven't yet, you should go through man, Every Man of Warrior, book one. Cultivating Holy Beauties, book one. You should be getting to Heather right now from the office, and you should be asking her, give me a packet, because I want to be in uh, Impact School of Ministry this time. But no, we, we, we're too running off after the things that are out here in this world, and we're not sustaining ourselves. That's why we walk around in drama, 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 drama. 
That's why we don't have victory. Because we're not eating at the table. We're not taking back what belongs to us. How many of you want to take back what the enemy has stolen? Some of you that are here can testify to this. Denise knows what I'm talking about. Some of the older folks that are around know what I'm talking about, but I can remember when I first gave my heart to Jesus. I I was working, 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 and then on the weekends, partying, partying, partying until 3 in the morning on Monday, and then driving to work and working, working, working. That was my life. And when I gave my heart to Jesus, it just, I I asked my grandparents one time, because it just seemed like every time I turned around, they were saying, we got church tomorrow night. (laughs) We got revival coming up. Revival, how long does that last? Seven days. Seven days. Some of us remember back when we had them for two and three weeks. Every night. And uh, some of us, you know what, we didn't miss. Some of us didn't miss because we were under legalism and we, we were told if we did miss, we were going to hell. But some of us went because, man, we, just, I, we couldn't get enough. I'm telling you, I couldn't get enough of the word of God. I couldn't get enough. I wanted to hear the word. Somebody could sit and preach for two and a half hours, Brother Payne. And, and I would sit there, and I, I never left going, man, alive. We'd go to the assemblies, and Brother Murray and some of those guys, man, would preach for two hours at a time. And, man, we'd be sitting there going, yeah, come on. Woo, give us something else. I was hungry. I'd lay awake till 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning reading my Bible. My grandfather would knock on my door, and he'd say to me, boy, you better get to sleep. you got to go to work in two hours. I'd say, okay, pal, I'll turn the light off in a minute. Sometimes I wonder, where did that guy go? You give in to the cares of this life. You give in to the trials and tests and things that come around. You're drawn away by your own lust and you find yourself, really, you find your tank starting to run empty. And we want to blame everything else. It's the kids, it's the wife, it's the husband, it's the job, it's the boss, it's the church, it's this, it's that, it's the other. They don't do it like I think they ought to do it. And we're fussing and fighting and carrying on. And there's strife and jealousy. And we, we're what in the world? What we need to do is we need to get a hold of the strong man that's taken up residence. And we need to cast him out. We need to take back, let the Holy Spirit take back this temple. Through the word and power, let kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What if we would surrender all? Come on, stand with me today. What if? Man, what if, what if we would surrender all? What if we would stop stop thinking with our carnal minds? And put on the mind of Christ. Man, what would happen? What would happen if everything else just didn't matter? Only that which was for the cause of Christ mattered. What if everything that we did was driven by a a passion for the kingdom of God? And if it was not something that fit into the kingdom of God, we wouldn't do it. Even if it wasn't sin. Some things you do may not be sin. The only sin in it is sometimes you push the kingdom aside for a little bit. It's not the thing in itself. 
it's what we should have been doing that we don't. And we allow the system that we live in to direct us and move us. We allow voices around us to move us off of the path to do what's right. We let traditions of men steer us. We let things that we've been brought up in hold us into bondage. But yet God tells us that he wants us to be free. He wants us to be free by growing in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. He wants us to be free through intimacy with Christ that can take place every moment of every single day. Another fallacy that's been taught by the church that we stand and, can, and try to encourage is getting people getting people to try to set aside just a little bit of time with the Lord as though he's a guest you see I'd be a guest at your home and you would say to me hey why don't you come over I got a little bit of time here I'll fix you a steak and I want you to know if it's within my power, I'm a coming over. I want that steak. But when I get there, it's not my home. I'm a guest. And so we're telling people, you need to set a little bit of time aside for the Lord. And we go back and we say, yeah, just like Daniel. He prayed at a certain time, three times a day. We like to get religious. I like to change my voice. Did you notice that? We like to at certain times get all religious, and we want to be like Daniel. Daniel, he, he set aside Pastor Doug three times a day. I'm going to pray this year after our fast that I can set aside at least two. Why do you want to cheat yourself? Why do you want to rip yourself off? When Jesus said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go pray. I'm going back to the Father. And I'm going to pray the Father sends you another comforter. That he just won't be on you. He won't just be around you. So you can talk to him every once in a while. Or set aside a time when, you, when he's got time to meet with you. I'm going to send you another comforter. He's not going to be just with you. He's going to be in you. So that every second of every moment of every day, you can be entertaining the presence of the Lord. Woo! Man, that ought, to, that ought to charge up our jets. What, Pastor Jerry? You mean everywhere I go, no matter how fast I'm moving, he's right here right now? He is. You can be in the midst of all kinds of people and you and Jesus having something big going on and they're there telling you all the problems that's in the world and you got this funny looking grin on your face and they're saying what are you grinning about oh I just got something going on his name's Jesus huh but the church, they're still running here, they're still running there, they're still running all over the place. If happily, they might find the answer. <laughs> the answer is right here. Who shall deliver me from this body of death? I thank God. Through Jesus Christ, my Lord. Woo! Folks, you can be free today. You don't have to let the old man have his way. Cast off the bondwoman and her son. Let the son of promise have his way. Let him have his way. Don't say... Deliver me, Lord. 
Don't say, set me free, Lord. Say this, Lord, I declare what your word says. Who the Son sets free is free indeed. I'm not asking God to be free. I am free. And I declare it. Hello? Is that you today? Is that you today? Is that how you're at, where you're at today? Have you been believing a lot of religious garbage? And it's got you entangled. You know, I, I believe some of you are sitting here this morning and you're saying to yourself, I don't want to believe what he said. I just don't know. I don't know. I, I don't know if that's right. <laughs> well, man, listen, where has that thinking got you? Why don't you surrender it to the Lord and just let him do whatever he wants to do? Why don't you just take the book for what it is? And say, if you said it, I'm going to believe it because it's so. I'm going to do the book. Won't you come and do the book with me? Huh? I'm going to do the book, Chancellor. Won't you come and do the book with me? And we're going to cast out the bond woman and her son. And we're going to give way to that son of promise, the fulfillment of it all. His name is Jesus. Amen. If you're here today as the worship team um, sings another song for us, as they do that, if you're here today and you need to have prayer, you want prayer, you want to come forward, step out from where you are, come forward this morning. We'll pray for you. Somebody will pray for you. We will believe with you. He is here, he is here right now. Help it to be more than a song, God. Right now, right now, right now. You need a touch from the Lord. You don't have to be ashamed. Come forward and let God. He's bigger. No matter how many times you've come, you can come.